our study in the Beatitudes of Jesus, we come today to number six, the sixth Beatitude, and we will entitle the message, How to See God. So let's stand together for the reading of the Scripture. The Scriptures are printed in your bulletin. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Thank you. Be seated, please. Man has always had a desire to see God. He doesn't have a desire to want God or to know God, but he would like to see God. That's called the beatific vision. Roman Catholics are high on beatific view. The Greeks came to the disciples and said, Sirs, we would see Jesus. Philip came to Jesus and said, Show us the Father. Moses said, Show me thy glory. So man has always wanted to see God. However, we will never see God in His unveiled essence, in His divine solitariness. We will never see Him with our physical eyes. But we will see God in two ways. Those two ways are, first of all, in His Word. When you go to His Word and read the Bible, you are seeing God's Word. That's the way you see God. You see Him in the types and the symbols of the Old Testament. But we will never see God's face for God is a spirit, and a spirit does not have a corporal body. Only in the incarnation did He become flesh in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. But as to His corporality, He is not a corporal person. Jesus is, but the Holy Spirit and the Father are not corporal. They are spirits. They are invisible to us. But when we see Jesus, we have seen the Father. One of the disciples said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. We'll be satisfied if you just show us the Father. What did Jesus say to him? Philip? Have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me? What did he mean by that? He did not mean that he and Jesus were the same person. There are three persons in the Godhead. But what he did mean is if you want to know what I am like, what I am to be seen like, Look at Jesus. Look at my son. I am just like my son. My son is 
just like me. We are one in three. Three persons in the Godhead, but only one God. You say, I don't understand how that could be. You don't need to understand it. You only need to believe it. The Bible teaches that very clearly. When Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River, the Spirit of God came down upon Jesus in the form of a dove. Jesus was standing in the water and the Father's voice came from heaven. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So you will never see God in His essence but there are ways that we can comprehend or see Him. In Ephesians 1.18, we learn that faith has eyes. Paul wrote to the church and said, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling, and what is the riches of the glory of of his inheritance in the saints. Notice the eyes of your understanding. We understand God through the eyes of faith. In Hebrews 11, Moses was down in the land of Egypt. And we read that he left Egypt by faith. Hebrews 11, 27. By faith. Now some people preach that he got afraid that Pharaoh was going to kill him so he ran in fear. No, by faith he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. What did Moses see? He saw Him who is invisible. He saw Jesus in His pre-incarnate glory. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 8 and 9, But now we see not yet all things put under Him, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. Have you seen that? Have you seen Him crowned with glory and honor? That He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now you need to know also, since I quoted that verse, that the word man is not in the original Bible. It was placed there by some of the scribes because they thought it belonged there. It didn't belong there because it was never given of the Holy Spirit by divine inspiration. It actually is speaking of every man who is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what it really means. Now there are three ways, maybe first I should say, sometimes I've had people ask me, when I get to heaven, will I see three people sitting upon three thrones? No, I don't believe so. I believe you'll see one person sitting on one throne and that is the Lord Jesus Christ in whom all the fullness dwelleth bodily. You will see Jesus because He's the only one who became incarnate. He became incarnate. That is, He took upon Him human flesh and entered the human family. But the Holy Spirit and the Father have never become incarnate. And they will not. But who you will see 
is he who in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth bodily. You will see Jesus on the throne and you will know the Father, you will know the Spirit, and you will know Jesus. That's the best I can explain that to you in a scriptural way. Now there are different abilities to see. We don't all have the same ability to see. There are three different ways to see. Some have limited vision. They are cross-eyed. Some are nearsighted. Others are farsighted. Some are colorblind. We don't all have the same ability to see a light. I cannot see without my glasses. And some of you maybe can, but I can't. So how do we see God? Three ways. First of all, by natural eyesight, we see mountains, rivers, beautiful flowers. That's natural eyesight. Then there's mental equations. A teacher is teaching a little class of boys and girls. And Johnny has a problem figuring out math. So she said, Johnny, here is one apple, and over here is another apple. Now, how many apples do you see? Oh, he said, I see two apples. She said, yes. Now you see. He said, yes, I see now. In other words, what he meant was mentally, I comprehend the meaning of two or one. Then the third way is in the heart. We see with the heart. The heart has eyes. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in chapter 2 and verse 9, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love Him. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is of God, that we might know the things that are given freely to us of God. We see God through the eyes of our heart. Matthew 5, 8, our text for today, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Heart purity is required. We see things as Christians that the world does not see. We know things as Christians that the world does not know. We understand things that the world does not understand because we have heart vision. We don't see those things outwardly, but inwardly in our hearts, we see the things that God is speaking about. That's how we see God. But not everybody sees God. The townspeople, of Jesus' day looked upon him and said, Is not this the carpenter's son? It's just a carpenter. Why all these claims that he makes? He's only a carpenter. But Peter said, when Jesus asked and 
said, Whom do men say that I am? Peter, with a vision from his heart, said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You see the two different visions? The townspeople, they didn't see anything in Jesus. But Peter, by divine intuition, knew who Jesus was, Son of God. John 5, 37, Jesus said, And the Father himself, which has sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. That word shape means his form. He has no form for you to see because he's invisible and immaterial. You can't see that which is invisible unless like Moses, God gives you vision to see. 1 John 4, 12. Well, first let me give you Colossians 1, 15. Speaking of Christ, who is the image of of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. Jesus is the exact image of God the Father. When you see Jesus, you see God the Father because He's just like God the Father. And then there's that wonderful passage in 1 John 4, 12 where He exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, now unto the King, that's referring to God the Father, eternal, that's His unoriginated existence, that's Christ, immortal, that means deathless, God will never die. There were some people years ago that started a theology called the Death of God Movement. They were mistaken. God was not dead and is not dead, but they were dead. Invisible, that means imperceptibility. We can know Him, but we cannot comprehend Him. You cannot figure out God. You cannot figure out His ways. His ways are inscrutable, incomprehensible. We can only know what the Spirit reveals to us of God. You cannot know one thing more about God than what the Holy Spirit reveals to you. And how does He reveal to us the things of God that we might know Him? He reveals to us by the Holy Spirit as we read the Bible. As we read the Bible. That's how we see. In my study this week, I saw some things that I had never seen before. Because the Holy Spirit showed me some things that I had never seen before. I've been preaching this Bible for almost 70 years. And I see something new every time I go to the Bible. Always the Holy Spirit reveals something to me that I hadn't seen before. That's how I see God. I see Him in the Scriptures. He speaks to me. He shows me. He reveals to me what I need to know about Him. You cannot comprehend God. You might take the smartest man in the world. They say that some people have a high IQ and others have a low IQ. But you can never know more than God reveals to you about Himself. And you'll never know any of those things 
until you start reading your Bible every day. In 1 John, he also says, the only wise God. He's the only God. There is no other God but Him. The only wise God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. Now occasionally you will pick up your Bible and you will read that so and so saw God. Well that's always qualified. For example, in Exodus 24.10 And they saw the God of Israel. Now you say, well it says right there they saw the God of Israel. Yes. Well, let's read all the verse. And they saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness. You see, God qualified that by saying, as it were. He didn't say that was God. He said it as it were God. The sapphire stone looked as God would look. But all they saw was a stone. He qualifies. We see Him in His manifestations. Sometimes the Bible speaks of seeing God when it's speaking of a manifestation of God. That is a way in which God showed Himself through certain activities, and that's a manifestation of God, but not seeing God Himself. The Bible is very clear in 1 John 4 and verse 12. No man hath seen God at any time that is in His essential deity. No man has ever seen God because God is invisible. I, he has been called in the Scripture the hidden God. He is a hidden God. He is hidden from this world. And let me point out, Isaiah 46, 15. The writer said, Isaiah said, Verily thou art a God that hidest thyself, O God of Israel, the Savior. Again, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 89, verse 46, How long, Lord, wilt thou hide thyself forever in times of trouble? Shall thy wrath burn like fire? Why standest, Psalm 13, 1, Why standest thou afar off, O Lord, why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Psalms 13, 1. How long wilt thou forget me, O Lord, forever? How long wilt thou hide thy face from me? That was David. And then Job added his part to it. In chapter 23 and verse 39, Oh, that I knew where I might find Him, that I might come even to His seat or throne. Behold, I go forward, but He is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive Him. On the left hand, where He doth work, but I cannot behold Him. He hideth Himself, on the right hand that I cannot see Him. We have many scriptures that speak of a hidden God. But He does have a way of revealing through other means His glorious person. We need to stop a moment since the Bible says blessed are the pure in heart. What is the heart? The Greek word is cardia, spelled with a K, K A R D I A. And we get our word cardiologist 
from the Greek word cardia, and it comes from the English word heart. The heart is the center of our personality. It includes the mind, the will, the emotions. It includes the whole person, the whole man. For example, Hebrews 4.12, the heart thinks. Marks chapter 2 and verse 6 through 8, the heart reasons. Matthew 13, 15, the heart understands. Romans 10, 9 and 10, the heart believes. Matthew 22, 36, the heart has emotions. 1 Corinthians 9, 7, the heart wills, purposes, determines. 1 Corinthians 9, 7. Peter said to the sorcerer, Simon, thy heart is not right in the sight of God. The problem with man today is his heart. His heart has a problem. It's hard. It's stony. It's rebellious. That's the human unrenewed heart. But when it's renewed by divine grace, then the heart is soft and pliable and obedient. Matthew 15, 18, speaking of the unsaved man's heart, says, For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. When I talk to unsaved people, and they say to me, Well, preacher, uh, I don't have a bad heart. I say, Well, the Bible says you have evil thoughts, you have murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies in your heart. Which one of those are you? Well, they don't like to admit to any of those. But that's what Jesus said was in the heart of unsaved man. That's you. If you're unsaved. Now the heart by nature is impure. That's why this beatitude says, Blessed are the pure in heart. They and they alone shall see God. Sin blinds the heart. Isaiah 6 and verse 9. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Verse 10. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. There God takes the eyes, the ears, and the heart. It shows that all three are unable to help a man see God. So what is meant by being pure in heart? God sanctifies His people two ways. He sanctifies them positionally by grace. Positionally, God extends grace to the believing sinner and He is, He has the purity of Jesus imputed to His account. So God sees Him possessing the purity the perfect purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God looks upon the sinner that's been converted, He sees the purity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He does not see the sin that we are in the old nature, but He sees us in Christ. And He sees us in the new nature. And He sees nothing but purity. That's our positional sanctification. Then there is a practical sanctification or state 
which is what we are daily in our person. We are not perfect except in positionally. Positionally, we're perfect. You'll never be much more perfect than you are now because you have the imputed perfect righteousness of Christ. But right now, we are not perfect in our daily lives. None of us are perfect. We all sin in word or deed or in some way. So although in God's sight we're perfect and pure, in actuality, daily, the old nature still dwells within us and it tries to tempt us to sin. So we have a positional sanctification which is perfect, and we own it now. It's been imputed to our account. But we are not perfect in our lives. Who would dare to stand up and say, I'm perfect. I've never sinned. Well, we would all know you were lying. Your neighbors would know. Your friends would know. We all sin sometimes. We are not perfect in actual daily life. Just be thankful that He sees us perfect in purity in His Son, Jesus Christ. To give you an example of God's people who were not perfect in their lives. Noah got drunk and committed the first sin in the new earth. Abraham lied and passed his wife off to a ruler as his sister. Moses became angry and struck the rock. Peter denied Christ three times as a believer. Paul in Romans 7 said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? These are God's people confessing their sinfulness. So you have two aspects of sanctification. Perfect and unperfect. It is your perfect sanctification that will take you to heaven. Has the fear of God implanted in every believer? He has the love of God shed abroad in his heart. The believer has his heart purified. And the more he despises indwelling lust, the more he has to daily deny self, sincerely confess his sins, and walk in righteousness. He lives a life of warfare. You read Ephesians 6. We're in the warfare. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, the shield of faith, the shoes of faith. You're in a warfare. Every day you're in a battle. You have to fight that fight. You have to win that battle. It's not lily pads floating along in a placid lake. Paul described the Christian life as a battle with a sword, a warfare. And any half a minute that you let your guard up, the devil's going to slip in and give you some kind of a temptation. You've got to fight. And you can win the fight if you do fight. Too many Christians give up the fight and give in to the devil. Don't give in to him. You don't have to give in to him. You can say no to him. When that woman down in Egypt tried to tempt Joseph into adultery, Joseph said no, and he turned and ran out of the house. That's one time when it's a good idea to run. He ran. He said no. He fought and he won the fight. The 
believer cannot make himself what he ought to be, but he can help God to make him what he ought to be. He has to take the means, the weapons that God has given him, and use them to affect his victory. You have to do the fighting. God will give the victory, but you have to do the fighting. David prayed in Psalm 51, 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That was David's prayer for a pure heart. In Psalm 51, 2, he said, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Now, he already had a positionally pure heart, but he knew that in reality, he had a bad nature to deal with. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Confession of sin is one of the first steps to victory. The blood of Christ is another. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's confession of sin. Then the blood of Christ gives purity. Revelation 7, 14. John is standing in heaven. He sees the saints of God clothed in white linen. And he asks the Lord, Whose are these? Who are these? Perfected people in white linen. Cleansed. And the answer came back. These are they that came out of great tribulation, great battles, and had washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Christ cleanses us daily. In 1 John 1, 7, if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. That's in the present tense, which means He continually, continually, continually keeps on cleansing us. He doesn't stop. He keeps cleansing us. So confession of sin and trust in the blood of the Lamb are two of the great implements of victory. That brings us to our standing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. That's where they get their pure standing before God. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day, and there may I, the while as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power, Till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Ere since my faith I saw that stream, His flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. That took care of our past. And it also takes care of our present. If we fight the good fight of faith. Purity is progressive. These Beatitudes progress one on top of another. Each one is a progression over the other until we reach the last one. We only have two more to go. The work of divine purity.
maturity begins here and now, and it is completed hereafter when we get to heaven. Philippians 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he that hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform it completely in that day. Quickly and in closing, how can I see Him? The heaven, I can see Him in creation. I love to go out at night and look at the stars. I'm not a pantheist. The stars are not my God. But they tell me of my God who created them. I see Him in creation. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. He is seen in His glory. John 2.11 This beginning of miracles when Jesus changed the water to wine. When Jesus in Cana of Galilee manifested forth His glory and His disciples believed on Him. 1 Corinthians 4, 6. To give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Julia Ward Howe, I believe, went down among the camps in the Civil War where the soldiers were bivouacked. And she saw the wounded and the bleeding. She saw the battle between the war of the South and the North. And she wrote a hymn. It's called the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She wrote, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning where with his terrible swift sword his truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watchfires of a hundred circling camps. They have builded him an altar in the evening dews and dance. I have read his righteous sentence in the dim and flaring lamps. His day is marching on. I see him in world history. I see the Armada of Spain with 11 or 12 warships sailing into the harbors of England. And I see the hand of God sends a windstorm and sweeps those warships back out into the sea and sinks them. I see the hand of God in the war. I see Him in the Bible. When I go into my little study and I sit down with my Bible and my books and I study and pretty soon I see Him. I see Him. In some verse of Scripture, God quickens that to my heart. And I see Him. Not with these eyes, but with His heart. I see Him. I see Him in the types of the Old Testament as the priest sprinkles the altar with blood. I see Him. I see Him in the feasts of the Passover. I see Him in the coats of skins that covered Adam and Eve's nakedness. I see Him in the uplifted brazen serpent and my spirit tells me that's a picture of the cross. And I see him in the persons of the Old Testament. Joseph, David, Solomon. I look at them and I see him. There are manifestations of him. I see him in his name. For there is no other name given unto him under heaven among men that we must be saved. I see Him in His attributes, in His wisdom, in His grace, 
in His providence, in His mercy, in His power, in His love. I see Him in all those attributes of God. I see Him in His providence as He works things out that I can't work out. I see His hand. And I see Him in the cross. As I saw Him that night, 70 some years ago, when a lost young man, I was sitting listening to a preacher. And he began to preach on the cross. How Jesus died for sinners. And I saw him. I saw him. Not with his eyes, but with his heart. I saw him. I'm going to leave out a page and close. We are going to see our Lord seated on His throne in eternal glory. We shall see Him. And the Bible says, and they shall see His face and His name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no candle, neither the light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign forever and ever. For now we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face. Now I know in part. But then shall I know even as I am known. We have the blessed hope. Face to face with Christ my Savior. Face to face, oh, when will it be? When with rapture I behold Him. Jesus Christ, who died for me. Face to face I shall behold Him. Far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all His glory, I shall see Him by and by. Only faintly now I see Him. With the darkening veil between, but a blessed day is coming when His glory shall be seen. Face to face I shall behold Him far beyond the starry sky. Face to face in all His glory, I shall see Him by and by. Face to face, O oh blissful moment, face to face to see and know. Face to face with my Redeemer, Jesus Christ who loves me so. Face to face, I shall behold Him far beyond the starry sky, face to face in all His glory, I shall see Him by and by. I see a little bit of Him now, from time to time, from day to day, but oh, I'm looking forward to that day when I shall see Him face to face. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer. Our Father, we thank Thee for Your promise that there is coming a day when our eyes will see You face to face. And in that time, we shall rejoice. And until then, Lord, help us to keep our eyes into the Scriptures so we can see you day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.